Hello, I'm Dr. Georges Benjamin. I'm the Executive Director of the American Public Health Association. I wanna welcome you to the eighth webinar in the COVID-19 conversation series brought to you by the National Academy of Medicine and the American Public Health Association. I'd like to thank my co-sponsor, Dr. Victor Zhao, President of the National Academy of Medicine for his strong support of this important effort. We are also grateful for the input of our expert advisory group which is co-chaired by Drs. Carlos Del Rio and Dr. Nick Laurie. You can find all of our advisors listed at covid19conversations.org. We're also grateful um, to this series um, because it is designed to explore the state of the science on COVID-19 to inform policymakers, public health, and healthcare professionals, scientists, business leaders, and the public at large. More information on the series and recordings of past webinars are available at COVID19conversations.org. Now today's webinar has been approved for one and a half continuing education credits for CHESS, CME, and CPH. Now none of the speakers has any relevant financial relationships to disclose. I want you to please note that if you want continuing education credit, you should have registered with your first and last name. Everyone who wants credit must have their own registration and watch today's event in its entirety. All of the participants today will receive an email within a few days from cpd at confex.com. So you should look for that, that's cpd at confex.com and it will have information on claiming your credits. All online evaluations must be submitted by June 26, 2020 to receive the continuing education credit. Of course, if you have any questions or topics that you'd like us to address today or on future webinars, please enter them in the Q&A box um, that's on your screen or email us at APHA at APHA.org. That is APHA at APHA.org. If you experience technical difficulties during this webinar, please enter your questions in the box, but please pay attention to the chat for announcements about how to troubleshoot. Again, if you have any um, questions, please pay attention to the chat box where we continually put information on there about how to troubleshoot. Now this webinar will be recorded and the recording and transcript will be available at on covid19conversations.org on the website. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Dr. Nikki Laurie, who's also one of the co-chairs of our advisory committee. Now, Dr. Laurie is a former assistant secretary for preparedness response at the Department of Health and Human Services during the Obama administration. And in that position, Dr. Laurie oversaw the federal public health response to various health crises, including Hurricane Sandy and the Boston Marathon bombing. Nikki, I'll turn it over to you today to frame our conversation. Thank you so much, Georges, and hello to, to all of you. Memorial Day marks for most of us sort of the notional beginning of summer. This is a summer when none of us really have much of an idea what to expect, but we do expect warming weather. With those come all kinds of weather events, tornadoes, hurricanes, and this time, um, while we've been hoping that COVID-19 might just burn out over the summer, it's not yet showing signs of doing those. We're looking at loosening restrictions after months of stay-at-home orders. I think we saw some evidence of some of that behavior over Memorial Day weekend. And, you know, there's a lot of pent-up um, activity on many, many fronts. We're also looking at thinking about how the economic recovery gets stimulated. So a lot of things are gonna to come together this summer um, that are hard to anticipate, but some of which we really need to think about now in advance. So we thought it would be useful to put together a webinar to explore these issues for a combination of short presentations and then a panel discussion. So I'd like to just start by introducing our panelists briefly. I think their bios are available to you, but, um, Kent Smetters is the Butner Chair at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School and a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research 
among others. And he is the faculty director of Penn's Wharton budget model. He's previously been at CBO, spent time at Stanford and been a deputy assistant secretary at the US Treasury. Um, Ativ uh, Mehrotra is a longtime colleague of mine, associate professor in the Department of Healthcare Policy at Harvard Medical School and a physician at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. His research focuses on evaluating the impact of delivery innovation, such as telemedicine, which we've obviously seen a ton of in this pandemic on cost, quality, and access in the US healthcare system. He received his medical degree from the University of California in San Francisco and completed his residency in medicine and pediatrics at Mass General and Boston Children's Hospital. And Craig Fugate, as a colleague during the Obama administration, was a phenomenal FEMA administrator from May 2009 uh, all the way through the uh, 2017. Prior to that, he served as Florida's uh, Governor James Butch's Emergency Management Director and also served with Governor Charlie Chris from 2007 to nine. He led FEMA not only through multiple record-breaking disastrous years and oversaw the federal government's response to many, many, too many to mention um, events, but he was a real voice for innovation and sent a clear and compelling vision, mission, and priorities for FEMA, relentlessly really driving the agency to achieve better outcomes uh, for survivors. And he's somebody that I really, uh, came to look up to and admire for all of his um, innovation. Uh, Craig now serves as the Chief Emergency Management Officer at One Concern and continues to do consulting on a whole variety of issues related to disaster preparedness and response. And finally, Linda Gudis, um, past president of APHA and a co-chair of the APHA Intersectional Council on Gun Violence Prevention Work Group. She's a lecturer at the School of Public Health at Yale and an adjunct professor um, at the Rollins School of Public Health uh, at Emory and also a member of NAM. She previously served as the director of the National Century for Injury Prevention and Control at CDC um, in, and was in a number of other roles. Um, she's a native of Chicago, has her degrees from DePaul University, her MSN and DRPH from Yale, and was a Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow in the office of um, my former Senator, Senator Paul Wellstone, and that's where I first uh, met Linda, actually. So it's a great group of people, and thank you all for being here. So I'm gonna go over to Professor Smetters to get us started. Thanks. Right, well, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. And if you could go to the next slide. Um, and the next one. <laughs> so at, certainly at one point, uh, every state has imposed some type of lockdown orders, as you know, and most states have started to uh, relax these orders, including um, stay at home orders, um, uh, especially on um, stay at home, but also on various non-essential business activities. And of, of course, this can have an economic benefit. That's the cool goal of trying to relax some of these uh, orders, but at the same time, it has costs. And we always, as a society, are making these trade-offs between the various risks that we, we take and the costs in this case, uh, things like cases, deaths, uh, and infections. So next slide. So we don't have a lot of time to talk about the framework that we use, but just at a high level, we gather a bunch of data, usually measured at the daily level, um, typically at the zip code or at the county level, in a couple of cases at the state level. And this type of data is not generally available from the government. Um, some of it is like weather data, but a lot of it is not. So it's a real uh, kudos to a lot of private companies who have really opened up their data, um, everything from uh, if cell phone locations that we get to, to figure out uh, 
encounters to employee scheduling uh, software uh, of, of firms so we can see businesses are open, closed, even how many people that they're uh, employing, even the, how many hours people are working. Uh, certainly initial claims, we look at web searches, lots of financial uh, data and so forth. And of course, and what we do get from the government is climate data and as well as some county level demographics, the age composition of the population matters, the labor force composition is, it, are we talking about a very dense uh, uh, financial service city or are we talking about Wyoming with more um, just kind of natural social distancing, say may, maybe more agriculture. And we put this, uh, uh, these data into a, an economic framework that does a measurement of social distancing and other key factors associated with all these different things, density of population, the type of work, um, and, and so forth. And um, th that feeds then into the epidemiological model, the, uh, the the standard SEER uh, type, uh, uh, framework. And we don't have time to go through in all the details, but as you probably know, those of you with the background, that the reproduction number, the R, sometimes called r naught, is a really key number in particular in terms of uh, cases and the spread. And it's really the most important number, even more important than the case fatality rate um, in, in, the, in these models. So next slide. And so what we do with this is that um, because we're not running just two miles separately, it's the economics that are determining um, the, uh, the, the things like R0 and the epidemiological variables. Uh, so they become inputs into epidemiological variables. Uh, it, what the model does, it, it basically gets us away from sometimes called the hammer and the dance. The hammer is, of course, we see cases going up at exponential rates. And so we put the hammer on, that's the quarantine, stay at home orders and so forth. And then there's this dance that is we start to lift them up, but we can't do it in a perfectly continuous way. So we kind of dance and hope that the cases don't start to explode again and so forth. The point of this framework is to, in fact, be more prospective rather than this adaptive myopic hammer and dance type uh, approach where you only use an epidemiological model. And so you can play with the model yourself if you like to. This is the similar interface. Just go to the Penn Wharton Budget Model website. If you just Google Penn Wharton Budget Model, you'll see the link there. And you can look at your state. You can do different types of policy scenarios, behavioral scenarios that I'll summarize. Uh, you can look at the entire United States that we'll talk about, but you can also drill down into your states and play little movies to see how things are changing over time and so forth. So uh, next slide. So the estimation strategy, it looks like this, this slide got a little squished, but the estimation strategy, we don't have time to go into a lot of detail, but the key about it is that we need to separate out uh, uh, cause and effect. And, and, and in particular, uh, one technique that we use is what's called principal component analysis. This really separates out things. For example, uh, some models have claimed that there's a big weather effect. And of course, there, we even pick up a weather effect. But it's also true that some of the weather effect that was picked up by some uh, epidemiological type models but it's also because there's also uh, uh, coming from colder cities that happen to be the northeast and uh, in northern uh, a part of the country. And those also tend to be more dense. And so we really need to separate density from weather. And principal component analysis is kind of the leading way to really do that. And then we use what's called diff and diff across time uh, treatment. This is a fancy language that economists uh, well, used to try to say we really need, do need to figure out and distinguish between cause and effect. Just because a state clamped down, um, is that did they clamp down and have an impact on cases, or were they clamping down in response to um, uh, cases? Um, we, it, it, there is some heterogeneity. You could think of some states being more blue states, some states being more red states, some states having different uh, social attitudes toward this, and that will allow for timing differences and allow us, therefore, to identify uh, uh, actually a source of a, a change in the policy. So what we don't want to do, what the mistake would be, but simply just to look at levels and extrapolate out levels, we really need to try to figure out uh, the, the difference from cause and, and effect. And so that requires all this more data to, at a really granular level to do that. So next slide. And so how we, uh, again, we'll have a lot of time to spend on this, but how we validate a model like this is we want to see if the model is properly set up and properly calibrated um, before the period where the policy is changed. 
um, and that's that vertical, I, I can't control the mouse, but if you see in each one of those boxes that you have this uh, line that's going down the middle of the box, um, that's kind of the, the left hand side of that is like, a, think of that as the pre-policy period, and the right hand side is the post-policy period. What we, and these are different ways that uh, governors have impacted social distancing, like emergency declaration, stay at home orders, school closures, and so forth. What we wanna see is in the pre-policy period, that in fact most of the stuff is random around zero is there's no specific trend around zero and then in the post policy period that's where we then will see the trends and we see actually emergency declarations themselves were not terribly effective at reducing social distancing the, the reason why is they were just kind of vague they didn't really by themselves do much they mainly um, unleashed uh, various laws around price controls, price gouging, things like that, freed up some resources. They didn't really do much about social distancing. Social staying at home orders had a big impact. School, school closures certainly had an impact. Restaurant restrictions did. Interestingly, we even saw um, uh, it, before uh, uh, policy came in, a lot of people were already going to fewer restaurants and so forth. And that's the reason why we need to do all these controls to make sure that we really are, are siphoning that out and separating that out. And so, hence, but it, when you see restaurant restrictions there, you see in the pre-policy period, it's still randomly distributed around zero so that we are really capturing the cause versus effect and not just picking up a trend that otherwise would have happened and, and other things. So when we go to the next uh, slide, um, and this is the SEER model. The SEER model is, uh, you know, it's been around for a long time. It's, it, it's first form was uh, the SIR model, susceptible, infected, resistant. Um, and then some years later, the exposed layer has been added. Um, and as you know, everybody, almost everybody is susceptible. Not everybody is exposed. Um, what became really important for COVID-19 is the fact that, as you know, asymptomatic uh, transmission is potentially a big deal. And so the infected part, we split out between the symptomatic population and the asymptomatic population. Uh, and so that's how it all has to be calibrated and so forth. There's absolutely no question. I mean, if you look at the U.S. data, there's so much sample selection in it. Um, you, there it has to be a lot of cleverness and so forth in how you even how we measure case fatality rates. We, we, there's still a lot of uncertainty about what the case fatality rate is and so forth. But it turns out this R value is the most important one. So we do a lot of sensitivity analysis around that. But um, it, nonetheless, the United States is not set up in a way that collects data um, in an unbiased way uh, 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 right now. So why don't we go to the next slide. And what uh, this R, this the R, the R value, and I should point out because I'm being this, uh, presumptuous here that everybody understands what R means. R is a replication factor. It's on average how many people uh, does an affected person in turn in, infect. So an R of two or three means that an affected person on average is going to affect two or three uh, more uh, more other uh, people. Uh, so the goal is to get R below one. R above one means we're on an explosive path of infections. R below one means that we, in fact, will be uh, non-exploding path. And, and so the whole goal is they eventually get R less than one. And we've seen that in a lot of states, uh, both policy and uh, pre-policy, the R was uh, has been coming down. Um, some states are still above R1, Wisconsin, Maryland, and so forth are still above uh, above one. So that will be a challenge as they begin to reopen. Uh, well, next slide. And here's the bottom line numbers. And this will be my last slide here. Um, and in particular, um, so uh, what this experiment does, this is just for the United States. You can go to the website and pull it down for your state. It's, it looks at two different uh, project, uh, uh, types of combinations here. One is the policy scenario um, and, and baseline is, so this uh, newest projection, I forgot to write this on the slide, sorry about this. This newest projection is between May 26th and July 30th. Um, and so we update every Monday. Um, so what this, this baseline policy means that whatever policy the state had as of May 25th, um, they keep that policy going up through end of July 30th. And behavior scenario is that people, whatever people are currently doing in that state in terms of social distancing, it will vary by state, by culture, by other factors. But whatever they're doing in that state, it's actually at the county level that we aggregate up, 
they continue to keep on doing. And we're projecting that by end of July, there will be about 2.7 million cases, about 153,000 deaths. Unfortunately, our death projections have been accurate uh, so far, and that's unfortunate because they have not been, uh, I've had many friends say they disconnected from me on social media because they were, they were depressed by the, these death projections, but they, uh, uh, so far they've been tracking what's actually happened. And so, uh, and we're also forecasting that there will be so, of the 33-ish million jobs that have been lost, about 1.6 will be recovered. And um, the last column, which is actually, I can't see on my screen, is the year-over-year -year GDP. It's, uh, it's saying that GDP will be about 4.3% lower than it was on July 30th of uh, 2019. But now suppose we consider these policies, we lift stay-at-home orders, uh, which are the remaining stay-at-home orders, but the be personal behavior doesn't change. Notice it has very little effect. That's because um, uh, what happens is that uh, uh, most states have already lifted the, uh, their stay-at-home orders. There's only a few counties and some states that are, haven't lifted stay-at-home orders. Um, so it doesn't have a huge impact. A full reopening uh, will increase deaths by 43,000, will increase eight, uh, eight, 800,000 uh, cases. I shouldn't say will, but that's what we're projecting. But it'll, but it'll also uh, 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 recover about 8.8 .8 million jobs. And just to be clear, that is... Um, uh, jobs over the forecast window, so that will uh, that won't mean that we'll we will uh, uh, go to pre-pandemic levels with an additional 8.8 .8 million jobs. Rather, it'll eat into the 33 some million jobs that we've lost, so reduce some of that job loss. But now, and this is the big takeaway: suppose that people now take this policy change as a cue that things are okay. So they start reducing their own personal social distancing. They're not staying six feet apart. They're not wearing masks. They're not, they're, they're, they're getting together in larger groups. This is what we call the reduced social distancing. And that we're not simulating this as saying that this is going to happen instantly. It follows a log scale. So a lot of it happens in the first couple of months, but we also recognize that schools are on break uh, during the summer and so forth. But if in fact we uh, uh, go to reduce social distancing, that has a much bigger impact on cases and deaths. So for example, if states just do a full reopening, we uh, project that deaths go up by 43,000 by end of uh, July. If they were to do that um, as of the beginning of this week uh, and continue that end of July, but if, in fact, people reduce their social distancing, notice deaths go up by 400,000 um, plus. And so it's the personal behavior um, that is actually even more important than policy. Policy is still relevant, but the personal behavior is super relevant here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That is quite a sobering assessment um, and, and set of projections that we have. And I think it it really also points to the kinds of education and messaging challenges that we're gonna have over the summer in terms of helping people understand the importance um, of the kinds of personal behaviors um, to limit spread, but at the same time, try to help the economy recover. And maybe during the panel discussion, we can talk about those more dire projections and what might happen to the economy if we have that much uncontrolled spread and excess deaths past your um, window. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime, why don't we turn over to Dr. Machotra to talk about managing the health debt from the month long pause and access to non-urgent care. Um, you know, we've heard so much about anything from kids missing immunizations to delays in elective procedures. So eager to hear what he has to say. Atif. Great. Thanks so much. If you go to the next slide. So I'm going to be talking about uh, and a focus not on the uh, economic and uh, health costs of the virus itself, but to be more broad and actually talk a little bit about the non-COVID related care and how Americans have changed their behavior during the pandemic in getting that care. And before I jump in and show you some results, I wanna like, why do we care? The first is it really helps to quantify the clinical or health impact of the pandemic and really highlight a concern that we have that the, one of the impacts of this pandemic is that many patients are dying, not because of the virus itself, but rather because they're not getting the healthcare that they need. 
And we're also critically, uh, this matters greatly because it also matters upon the economic impact of the pandemic and specifically on healthcare providers. And this potential paradox we might face, which is that at the same time, so many people are becoming ill in the United States and seeking care for the virus. At the same time, healthcare providers are struggling financially and many might go, under bus uh, may many might go out of business. So the next slide. So what has been the impact of the pandemic on the number of visits in the United States? What we're showing you here is on the x-axis is the number of visits per week to roughly 50,000 uh, healthcare providers from across the nation. And what we're showing you here is as a percentage change from the baseline prior to the pandemic and specifically the week of March 1st. So before uh, early March, uh, we had you know, the same number of visits, they were around the same. And then starting in the week of March 8th and progressively through the week of March 29th, we saw a rapid and frankly dramatic decline in the number of visits, both telemedicine and in-person visits to the United States, a 60% almost decline uh, by early April. Next slide. What we've been doing is following those visit trends uh, through this month. And as of the week of May 10th, just two weeks ago, we've started to see a bit of a rebound in the number of visits. Now the visits are down, instead of being down 60%, are down roughly 30%. So substantially down, but a bit of a rebound. Next slide. One of the things that uh, all of you on the phone, uh, on the webinar, as well as Americans are, are you know, doing for the first time, as Nikki mentioned, is telemedicine. We are, uh, and we're getting care in a very different way of actually via video or via the phone. What this graph shows you is uh, that in numbers. So here we're showing you the percentage of all visits that were prior to the pandemic, how many are now being provided by telemedicine. And at that same time, there was that dramatic decline in overall visits. We saw a big rise in the number of visits that were provided via telemedicine, rising quickly by mid-April up to about 14% of baseline visits. To kind of give you a sense of what that means, there are roughly about a billion office visits per year in the United States. And so if these were project out for 12 months, that'd be about 140 million visits via telemedicine. Of, uh, obviously, a big change than prior to the pandemic. Next slide. I want to clarify that yes, telemedicine visits did rise, but they only partially offset the drop in in-person visits. So this graph goes back and this is the, that blue or turquoise line that we saw previously was the drop in all visits. And in orange, I'm showing you the decline in in-person visits. And that gap between those two lines is the telemedicine visit. So it only partially offset the drop that we had seen. The next slide. That's overall. What we've seen is very different reactions, uh, different uh, visit patterns um, across the clinical specialties. So in orange, I'm showing you here the percentage decline in overall visits through the week of, uh, in the week of April 5th. And you can see for sur some surgical specialties, the decline in visits was much greater, more than 70%. But if you go to areas such as behavioral health, uh, endocrinology or primary care, you're seeing less of a decline. And I think that's really relevant uh, uh, to the clinical impact as we're seeing more and more patients uh, suffer from anxiety, depression during the pandemic, and can they get the care that they need? Next slide. How does this vary by age group? And if we again focus on the orange lines, the week of April 5th, we see the greatest decline among children, those between the ages of three and 17 in particular, our school-aged children, as well as those adults greater than uh, 75. Um, and obviously that also, in particular for that oldest age group is very concerning given that's where the highest burden of chronic illness is. So the next slide. So why should we worry, what should we be, what do these visit trends tell us and what should we be worried about in the coming months? As I indicated before, there is substantial concern that patients are dying not because of the virus, but because they didn't get the care they need. And folks have talked about a potential second pandemic of patients being hospitalized because their heart failure, their asthma, their COPD, or their diabetes was not well managed. And, we, and when we think about the global impact of the pandemic, we need to really consider those issues. If you go to the next slide, 
You know, it's interesting on uh, two days ago, the New York Times had a nice piece really describing how patients are scared to go and get healthcare, anywhere ranging from patients who are refusing a transplant to other types of care. And two quotes really jumped out at me. Um, if you click again. One doctor would describe people are saying, so I'm having a heart attack, I'm going to stay home. I'm not going to die in that hospital. And that quote is reflected in the data where we're seeing roughly 50% declines in the number of patients coming to the hospital with a heart attack. And let me be very clear, staying at home with a heart attack is very dangerous and life-threatening. It could lead to malignant arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. And I'm very concerned, and I think there is some evidence that patients have died at home because they did not get care. And I get it. I understand why patients are scared uh, to get in. One person told the Facebook group in this uh, New York Times piece that every time she has to go in for a scan or blood work, she has a borderline meltdown because she's scared to get the care that she needs. So the next slide. So uh, we're worried about patients dying because they didn't get the care. We're worried about the second pandemic, uh, a potential second pandemic. I think the other aspect of this, as I alluded to before, we saw significant declines in the number of children who are getting care, and that means fewer children. And uh, many of you have heard about pediatricians worried that children are not getting the immunizations they need, and that's going to have significant impact as we move forward here in terms of concerns about, say, another measles outbreak. I alluded to the fact that the pandemic, the stay-at-home orders have led to increasing patients having mental illness, uh, suffering from mental illness, such as anxiety or depression. Can they get the care that they need when we're having such a global decline in visits? And last, and, uh, but equally importantly, is this, as I indicated, a parent paradox that despite all these patients needing the more care for the virus, this huge drop in visits that I'm describing to you has led to substantial financial strain on practices. We've seen health systems cut salaries. We've seen tremendous amount of furloughs. Much of the increase in unemployment we've seen is actually surprisingly coming from the healthcare uh, industry. And lastly, if those in the coming months, if those practices have to go, uh, go out of business, then that's going to uh, even worsen the strain on the healthcare system to absorb the, the care that they need to provide. So I'll end there and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, again, continued sobering assessments, I think, of, of what is going on here. Well, you know, as we mentioned, it's, it's summertime and hurricane season, and, um, you know, Craig Fubert is no stranger to managing many concurrent emergencies, and I'm going to look forward to his reflections on managing concurrent emergencies in the summer of COVID, and I, I know that one of the things that's been, been really highlighted in the past few days is not only that we are likely to have a worse hurricane season this year, but that many of the people who typically volunteer in emergency response are older people, and they are at particular risk if they uh, volunteer in settings where COVID transmission is likely. So eager to hear um, your thoughts and approaches to this, Craig. Well, thanks, Nikki, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Disasters won't start, stop for a pandemic. We know that. And as we're preparing for uh, hurricane season, we've already seen dam failures, floods, tornadoes, uh, and a forecast also for active wildfire season. And I think a lot of people just throw their hands up in the air and go, you know, how do we do all this? And for emergency managers, uh, it's not an option. We're gonna have to address this. So why is a pandemic so much different uh, than the other disasters? And, and I think this is, it helps us understand what we're dealing with. Uh, pandemics, as well as things like cyber attacks and, and climate, are not geographically based. There's no border. Uh, most disaster responses, an area gets impacted, and we'll pull resources from across the nation, in some cases across the world, to respond to that event. Well, in a pandemic, particularly with COVID-19, where people are the vector, moving people either to respond or as Nikki pointed out, volunteers, is a risk that we will bring more uh, people into an area where either they may be introducing uh, further spread or they may become exposed and bring it back home. 
And so that's our first consideration. The second consideration is a lot of our mass care activities to take care of the public, evacuations, mass sheltering, feeding operations, all are also potential amplifiers of spread of this virus. So emergency managers have been looking at this and planning for this. And there are some, we think, rather straightforward solutions. They're not perfect, but they are answers to this question. How do we respond effectively while minimizing the risk of further spread of COVID-19? And the first will be, again, for our responders, uh, ensuring that they have protective equipment, that we are deploying them in a way that minimizes their exposures, uh, keeping teams that are coming in from the outside uh, separate from other teams to not commingle teams. This may mean that we'll have to set up more areas to house workers that are separate instead of one large base camp. This is consideration being made for the wildland fire community. The other is the responders themselves to volunteers. If you think about what we see in many disasters uh, from Red Cross, Salvation Army, uh, Team Rumicon, uh, you know, a variety of organizations, is people traveling from all over the country to help provide mass care. That might not be our best option this year. Our best option may be, as we see with World Central Kitchen and other organizations, some of which are using FEMA funding, that instead of bringing the volunteers in to prepare meals for people, during a disaster is we hired the displaced food service industry. Uh, restaurants and others that are just now starting to open are still way under their capacity. And by putting people to work in a disaster area, uh, particularly those locations and restaurants that are able to get open, we can perform many of our mass care functions uh, by putting people back to work. Uh, we still have very large unemployment numbers. Our hospitality industry is, is, is been one of the most adversely affected. And these are things that are eligible for reimbursement by FEMA in a disaster. So I think we need to look more at buying our uh, uh, supplies and capabilities locally and putting people to work and not be as dependent upon volunteers, particularly going the, the, the numbers that we may need in things like hurricanes. Uh, on the other side of that will be the evacuation and mass care. FEMA, the American Red Cross, and the National Organization on Volunteers Acting in Disasters have been working on NAS Na Ma national mass care strategies for some time. This year, they have updated all of their plans to look at uh, incorporating social distancing and other practices as required to, to manage COVID-19. And no secret to anybody, we know that uh, shelter operations will be a high risk factor. Uh, two of the key ingredients that will determine the risk of those shelters is how many people for how many days they're in that shelter uh, could result in explosive numbers of exposures to any, uh, any, any people in those shelters if they are exposed to somebody. And with asymptomatic patients and, and not an adequate and enough testing to test everybody going to shelters, uh, it will be uh, of concern. There is another option, and that is many areas that are in coastal evacuation zones also are seeing, even with the reopening, significant vacancies in hotels and motels. And as a first line of shelter operations, particularly in smaller disasters, uh, much of the guidance is now suggesting non-congregate care shelters or non-mass care shelters and utilizing hotels, motels, residents, and other activities to shelter people in smaller groups uh, while maintaining social distancing. Uh, where we will end up uh, sheltering, the goal is to run smaller shelters this will require more staffing, but again, we can hire people in the local communities to help staff these shelters. Uh, and also look at running them for shorter durations. If we see the need that people cannot return home, uh, begin processing those folks to hotels and motels as well. This will cost a lot more money and state and local government budgets are, are, are under tremendous pressure these days. Uh, the goal is with the federal assistance to help offset these costs 
and provide the resources that local governments and states will need. Uh, but again, to, to summarize, if we need to reduce the amount of people traveling into disaster areas, we need to treat the people in the area as a resource and do more hiring and, and uh, buying of local capabilities. Uh, we still need people to evacuate. We have to be absolutely clear on this, that we cannot have people uh, so fearful of COVID-19 that they stay in dangerous areas. And that will be a challenge for hurricane evacuations where historically we've not had high compliance in some areas for evacuation orders. Uh, and this year with COVID-19, I think that message is gonna be difficult. Uh, we need people to evacuate to a safer location. We need to maintain the social distancing and other tools we know in these shelters. Uh, and we need to adjust our messages for preparedness. And that is add uh, protective mask and, and sanitizer and other items to people's disaster kits, particularly those that have to evacuate. So there's a lot of work being done. Uh, we can expect to see uh, disasters over the lifespan of COVID-19. And we are seeing those adjustments being made. The last issue will be impacts on the existing healthcare systems. I'm less concerned about the impacts on patients that may be generated from the disaster as much as the requirement to evacuate healthcare facilities in disasters such as hurricanes. In Florida, we see high levels of incidence of COVID-19 in assisted living facilities and nursing homes, as well as hospitals that are built in hurricane evacuation zones. Not always the best decision about siting those facilities, and in moving those, the normal plans are to relocate them to sister facilities. This may be a very uh, difficult thing to do if we have incidents of spread already in nursing homes or assisting living facilities, and we move them to another location, for perhaps introducing another scenario of an uncontained outbreak. We did a lot of work early in COVID-19 to develop uh, temporary hospitals. They, in many cases, were not as utilized as there was concern they may need to be. But those may be better options to plan for and set up in hurricane-prone areas where we may see evacuations of healthcare facilities that rather than directing them to go to sister facilities outside of the area of impact, we utilize the temporary healthcare facilities that can be set up, isolate and care for those populations during their evacuations, and uh, hopefully manage uh, not creating further spread of COVID-19 by commingling different populations in these facilities in an evacuation process. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on. There's a lot of concern out there, but I think there's solutions, but it does mean we're gonna have to think differently about this and take these lessons and build them into our plans. Uh, with that, uh, thanks, Nikki, and I'll turn it back to you. Good. Thanks so much. And, and I think a really helpful discussion about some, you know, ways to change our thinking and some creative solutions here in, in the face of um, what we all know will be enormous challenges. Our final speaker for today, um, Linda DeGudis, um, is somebody else I'm really looking forward to hearing from. I know at the outset of this, we worried a lot about um, things we see in almost every disaster, spikes of domestic violence, spikes of child abuse, et cetera, particularly when people are locked down at home and um, kids are not in school. Um, both with that and now letting up on some of the social distancing, Linda's going to talk to us about some of the data and thinking about what to expect. Over to you. Great. Thanks very much. And thanks very much for the opportunity to talk about this. Um, I think these are issues that we have not spent as much time talking about during this pandemic as maybe some of the other um, health related issues, but certainly something that we need to think more about. Um, next slide. Um, first of all, I just wanted to define violence because I think we all have different ways of looking at it, but the World Health Organization really looks at it as, as an intentional use of physical force or power that's threatened or actual, and it's against oneself or another person or a group or community, and it results in this high likelihood 
um, of injury, death, psychological harm, maldevelopment, or deprivation. Um, and there's three types that we see. And the first two are the ones that we're seeing right now most commonly during the pandemic. There's the self-directed violence, which is suicide or other kinds of self-harm, and then interpersonal violence. And as Nikki mentioned, the intimate partner violence that we know increases during other, uh, that has increased during disasters, assaults, homicide, child abuse and neglect, and then something that we haven't looked as much at, but there is potential for it, elder abuse and neglect. Next slide. So violence in natural and natural disasters, we have evidence that people who have been exposed to natural disasters may develop mental health issues such as the post-traumatic stress disorder, um, depression, anxiety disorders, and an increased suicide risk. In a recent study, um, a group looked at low-income women in New Orleans and looked at them at one, four, and 12 years after um, Hurricane Katrina. And they were looking at what they experienced and what kinds of things have impacted them in the long term because they had a range of traumatic experiences. And a lot of those are very similar to what we're seeing during the pandemic. Things like bereavement, lack of access to medical care, uh, and inability sometimes to get medications. And what this study showed was that during those time periods, these exposures that were most strongly associated with the negative outcomes and the negative health outcomes were those that were most common to what we're seeing in the current pandemic, the um, psychological distress, post-traumatic stress, general health and you know, kind of physical um, inability to go to the doctor or difficulty getting to a doctor's office. And so we know that we have the potential for seeing more of these in the long term. And then other contributing factors for mental health and violence risk, you know, the personal threats that someone feels to their own life, um, but certainly the loss of loved ones and with this pandemic, the inability to be with them at the time um, that they are dying or prior to their death, um, property loss, perhaps from an ability to pay from the economic impacts, some of the breakdown of social support systems and some social isolation, which is especially devastating to older adults. Um, and then scarcity of basic provisions. We've seen scarcity of various kinds of food, um, powerlessness, and then again, the economic stress. So next slide. So um, domestic violence, we know right now that in about 100 and 40 American cities and counties in 48 states, there have been some significant increases in calls to domestic violence hotlines. And the largest increase in um, the month of April was 274% in Alabama. Um, the stay at home orders and lockdowns certainly have an impact on people who are experiencing intimate partner violence because it forces them to shelter in place with the perpetrator of the violence and makes it extremely difficult for someone to leave an abusive relationship. And in this time period, the shelters that someone might go to are also faced with the challenge of providing protection from the violence itself, from the perpetrators, as well as protection from spread of the coronavirus. Next slide. Um, assaults are another issue and we're seeing more and more assaults as this pandemic is going on. In some conversations I've had with the emergency department physicians recently, they've said that they are seeing an increase in the number of assault related injuries that they're seeing in the emergency department. And these are often things that are happening when people are getting into an argument over something on the street or getting into an argument over whether or not somebody's um, wearing a mask or distancing themselves enough. Um, or assaults on workers who are trying to maintain protection at some place of business. And some of those workers have not been trained in how to deal with workplace violence. Um, so we're, we again see this increase in assaults and the risk of more assaults occurring over time. Next slide. And some of the risk factors for mental health issues and suicide. Again, the social isolation is a major one. Um, fear, certainly, of uh, 
becoming ill or dying from the virus, the stress that people are under, whether it's stress of um, job loss, stress of having their children at home with them, stress of being in a situation where they don't have their usual social supports, and the economic losses that were talked about earlier. Um, suicide risk um, calls to a suicide hotline in LA increased from 20 in the month of March in um, 2019 to 1800 in 2020. Certainly depression is another risk factor and for people who suffer depression, um, who may not be able to access their health care provider or their mental health provider, it certainly is a risk factor. And then we have the issues now that we're seeing with healthcare workers who are exposed to stresses as they take care of patients with COVID-19, both um, you know, the pre-hospital care workers, emergency medical services, physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, the range of people who are taking care of patients um, with COVID-19 and are seeing the death and the outcomes and the difficulties that people are having with this pandemic. Next slide. Um, another issue is with firearms. And we knew that firearms sales in March um, increased 85% compared with March of 2019. And it was the highest firearm sales that were ever recorded in the United States. We've seen people at um, state rallies, at um, government centers outside, um, rallying with firearms, saying they want things to open up. This has been some of the um, sort of push to open. Some people have carried guns, open carried. Um, and then we know that people who purchase a gun, a handgun, have a 22-fold higher rate of firearm-related suicide within the first year than people who don't have one. We also know that um, in men, especially for every 10% increase in firearm ownership, rate at the state level, there's an increase in suicide of 3.1 per 100,000 people. And that the presence of a firearm at home is associated with a two to 10 times greater risk for suicide than in a home without a firearm. In addition to that, we also know that it poses a risk um, not just related to suicide, but if a firearm is not stored properly or safely to children who might pick up a firearm that is loaded. So we know that there are a lot of risk factors um, that are now in place because of what we're seeing with the increase in firearm ownership. Next slide. Um, so firearm violence, we also might have thought that we would see significant decreases. However, we have seen decreases in mass shootings. Um, those are the smaller proportion of the shootings that we see. Um, this year, Chicago had its deadliest Memorial Day weekend since 2015, when 10 people were killed and 39 wounded, and fatalities from gun violence increased 14% in the second week of April this year compared to the same period last year, and this is overall across the country. Other cities are seeing similar issues to Chicago. Philadelphia is experiencing an increase, Baltimore, and a lot of city leaders are really concerned that once the lockdowns are lifted and the weather improves, that we are going to see some additional increases in violence. Next slide. Um, one of the other issues is alcohol and other drug use. And we know as a baseline, about one in 12 US adults has a substance use disorder. Only about 7% um, of, of physicians can effectively treat opioid addiction by providing um, some of the medications that really help someone who is addicted to medications such as buprenorphine. Um, and individuals who um, smoke, vape, uh, use opiates, or use methamphetamines are probably more vulnerable to some of the worst outcomes associated with um, COVID-19 because of their um, respiratory, the impact on their respiratory system, but also a lot of these individuals have lost access to their usual support systems. They are also stressed. Um, they may be unable to get to their group support um, kinds of activities that they normally would. And so they have risk factors for relapse and self-medication. We know alcohol beverage sales have increased by 55% since 
in late March. And we also have seen um, cities and states put in an option for takeout food orders with alcohol. We see people having online happy hours and meetings. And um, there are also now some reports of people who are working from home, um, not finding it uh, unusual to have a drink as they're working from home. Um, there's also difficulty in connecting again with the support groups um, for many people. And for other drugs, the social distancing may increase the risk of overdose deaths and the physical effects of the drug use can increase the risk of complications from COVID-19. Next slide. So, you know, in kind of a summary, we're dealing with multiple public health crises during the pandemic, the violence, the mental health risks, the alcohol and other drug use, and these are not gonna go away as we open things up. In fact, some of them may get worse. There may be people who have um, some of the risk factors or symptoms of some of these problems who did not have them before the pandemic. So we really need to be thinking about how we are going to consider the risks for the interpersonal and self-directed violence that we're seeing now and as I said might increase some of the mental health issues and the increases in alcohol and other drug use and this also includes providing people with access to the services um, that they will need in order to deal with some of these issues. So, um, so we have multiple public health issues to deal with along with the pandemic and I think um, these are going to be some major challenges for us. Well, thank, thanks um, so much for, for that as well. You know, as I'm listening to you and connecting some dots between your talk and Atib's talk, you know, one of the, the brighter areas and this otherwise somewhat um, depressing talk has been um, a real increase in the use of telehealth uh, for behavioral health and particularly for substance use disorders. And we are now suddenly seeing a lot of innovation or far fewer restrictions in prescribing of buprenorphine, methadone, and other things um, through telehealth. And so maybe as we get into the Q&A, it might be interesting to talk about some of the positive innovations um, that have come from this as well. So you've all been sending in lots of great questions and Laura thankful, thankfully has been sending them to me and I might, um, paraphrase a couple of these and combine them as we go forward. And so maybe um, the first question um, I think is going to be for, for you, Craig, um, you know, you're sort of no stranger at all to the, uh, the politics of emergencies. And yet most of the kinds of disasters that I think you've been involved in responding to, um, people are to a large part, able to respond a little bit apolitically. It's a space where we've seen people across the political spectrum come together to help one another out in response and some aspects of the recovery. This pandemic seems to have gotten really politicized in lots of ways. And so um, Carlos Del Rio, my co-chair, will tell us that whether you wear a mask or not in Atlanta is taken as a indication of which political party you, re, you belong to, et cetera. I'm wondering, Craig, if you have thoughts about sort of opportunities to depoliticize this as we think about responding to um, other kinds of emergencies over the summer and fall and any advice that you might have about how to accomplish any of that. And then if others want to jump in, they should feel free. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how we address the culture war that we're seeing played out with COVID-19 and, and a long-term war on science. But I think it's important that, uh, particularly the healthcare community, speak with clarity and not just tell people what they need to do, but explain to them why they need to do it. Uh, ultimately, the public's going to have to make their own decisions, but I prefer they do it with an informed decision and know the why, uh, and hopefully we'll see compliance. As we go into the, the, the potential for hurricanes, this will become a great concern in shelter operations if we see uh, a high degree of non-compliance as a political statement at the same time 
we may literally have hundreds, if not thousands of people in congregate care settings in these evacuations uh, and the potential exposure there. So again, I think we do a lot of, uh, uh, there's, yeah, there's a lot of politics here. I also think we do a lot of telling people what to do. I'm not sure they're always hearing the message why we're asking them to do that and I think that's going to be our key uh, to helping increase compliance and understand that some people, no matter what we say, won't be compliant whatsoever. And we're going to have to prepare for that and its impacts on potential spread. No, th thanks for that. And I think that's, um, that's an incredibly well taken point. And it seems that emergency planners and public health planners both could be working right now on the kinds of messages for why you're going to need to take these kinds of actions. Um, should we need to evacuate, get into shelter operations and others? And maybe it's an opportunity to take away some of the labels. I guess, um, I guess we can see there. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to get into this bit of a conversation. Um, I can't um, see folks for whatever set of reasons. Um, but the next question, I think I might um, start um, proposing to our first two speakers. Um, and that has to do with the fact that um, we all know that disasters, you know, sort of are an equal opportunity destroyers and that poor and minority populations are, dis, um, are often disproportionately impacted by all kinds of disasters, whether they're natural disasters or whether there's pandemics. And we've seen obviously lots of excess mortality, particularly in African-American communities um, during this. Um, I'm wondering, Professor Smoder and, and then um, Dr. Magrota, whether your modeling has able to either look at sort of not necessarily disproportionate impacts, but how to think about the equity considerations as we think about reopening either slowly or gradually. I know one of the questioners talked about this being an on-off switch, um, but as we open either slowly or gradually, um, you know, whether there are ways to do this that have more or less implications for equity. And then maybe, Ati, if you could talk a little bit about um, what we're seeing in the healthcare system with regard to differential use and the equity considerations. Um, sure. No, I think that's a great question. And right now, our model is not um, specifically reporting out by race, by income. Um, it, now, because we go all the way down to the local county level, in most cases, those factors are highly correlated with um, what we do measure and um, uh, observe. Uh, but it, it, so we, in fact, do have that essentially going on inside the model, but we're not reporting it out separately. And it's something that we uh, uh, want to do at, at some point. Um, but I think it, the issue, you know, as of course with race is, as is well known, they're often in the front lines in the service industry, uh, more exposed. They're also on the back side, less likely to. Uh, go to a doctor early on, maybe because they're afraid of out-of-pocket expenses, even though the law is the law in terms of uh, 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 hospitals uh, and, and coverage for COVID-related stuff. But still, there's a lot, a lot less historic attachment. Um, it, it's also true that if you look at some of these areas that, again, more at the zip code level, this personal social distancing that kicked in in so, some zip codes um, it happened a lot faster in some zip codes than other zip codes. And so there's also this issue of it, our, our um, more concentrated areas that are maybe are lower income. Do, are, do they actually trust government? Do they actually trust the, um, what they're hearing? And do they actually take personal action in, in response uh, to that? And we actually saw some evidence um, that we haven't reported out yet, but that that is actually true. Uh, even before policy, uh, higher income, uh, even controlling for density, higher income zip codes tend to you tend to see more uh, personal social distancing happening even before the policy relative to similarly dense zip codes um, with lower income. And so there's a lot of nuances, a lot of factors. We don't get into the you know normative 
language about uh, what the government should or should not do. And one reason why, um, you know, our, so our, our numbers are tracked by both sides. I mean, um, our numbers were reported on both Stephen Colbert and Rush Limbaugh. So you're thinking about both sides of the debate here. And the reason why we tend to appeal to both sides is simply because we're just about the numbers. We never say, is this right or wrong? Um, and let the chips fall where they may. And so uh, at the same time, um, we are about nuance. And these, there's a lot of nuances here um, be, be, besides the obvious issues about frontline workers and insurance status that have to be addressed. And so I think as we showed in the, in the, in the slide is that personal social distancing is really important. So trust in government messaging, therefore also becomes very important. Uh, as well. If you don't trust the messages coming from their government, then you, you are, and therefore don't change your personal social distancing in response, that, that will lead to more disease. No, good. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think the, the question is a really critical one and some, uh, here on this, uh, the impact of this and how it varies by, um, and potential for this to increase disparities in care. You know, you alluded to, uh, Nikki, you alluded to the fact that one of the silver linings of this uh, pandemic or something that I've been excited about has been that rise in telemedicine. And it's been a great way to bridge care. But doing a telemedicine visit, or at least for a video visit, requires what all of you are using right now in this webinar. You need to have a computer. You need to have a high-speed internet. You need to either, or a smartphone with a wireless plan. And many of the audience is well aware of the digital divide where we see, uh, not surprisingly, poorer communities, uh, uh, communities of color, as well as our oldest age groups, not having that capacity to do this video visit. And so this weird situation we could have, which is that telemedicine has been doing an amazing job, at least partially uh, fitting, uh, meeting the access needs of the, of the nation, but at the same time, those very high risk communities could be actually not able to join in. Therefore, uh, 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 in a strange way, telemedicine might be increasing disparities. And it raises another uh, thing that we need to be focused on for the coming months and years is that how do we bridge that digital divide? And there are many federal programs that are available, but do they have the resources uh, that are necessary because that has become so critically important in terms of people's health? Great, thank you. So the next question is also sort of a positive question, um, which is how might the healthcare and public health systems be permanently changed by COVID-19? And other than telehealth, what are some positive innovations? So maybe I will ask um, you to comment first, Ativ, and then, um, and then Linda, and then Craig, if you have uh, thoughts about that too, feel free to chime in. No, it's been a, a, it's a great question. You stole my thunder because I was going to talk about telehealth, but that has been an amazing uh, aspect of this, which is, you know, and I'll just say the point, which is that the changes that uh, we expected to happen over a decade happened in three weeks. It was just a remarkable change. But I do think that as we look throughout the healthcare system, we are starting to see innovations accelerate um, in uh, and the changes that we're making. So um, one of the things that I've been really intrigued about is, is that because patients are staying at home, we're thinking again about how we can provide care in the home and maybe giving patients a little bit more ownership of their healthcare problems. So to be a little bit concrete, does, do women need to come in for all those prenatal appointments? Can Some OBGYNs are sending patients home with fetal heart monitors so they can do that care at home. That's really helpful for a busy mom who's got a toddler in the house and she doesn't have to come in. We're trying to provide and we're questioning how much of that care needs to happen and can we provide that care within the home? And I think that's a really important aspect of it because uh, the pandemic has really challenged some of our usual ways of doing things um, in a way that I think uh, will have a lot of positive benefits as we move forward. I would say that, uh, you know, the question of telehealth, I mean, I think it's a great opportunity to see some development that way. But I think um, some of the issues that are now coming to light because of the pandemic about vulnerable populations and about people who can't access care or don't have 
ways to get to care and don't even have internet available to them at their home because they don't, you know, the lower income, they're not able to afford it. Um, those are some of the things that I think we can now start to think about how do we address them and use this opportunity to figure out how to address some of the vulnerabilities that people in various places have. You know, we've, we've, we're seeing the vulnerabilities of people who live in food deserts, for example, what they have. Um, right now because they can't even get food they because there's no place for them to go nearby. Um, they can't get out their, you know, their sheltering in place or locked down. Um, and I think one of the interesting pieces of all of this is we didn't, um, we didn't move to open the libraries quickly yet. Um, they weren't, there wasn't advocacy for opening the libraries, which is where, you know, a number of, a lot of people who don't have other kinds of access to um, internet and to the, you know, everything can't, it's where they might go to do things. Not that that would be, we would have to implement a number of kinds of um, safety, um, you know, ways to keep them safe. But I think it's something we need to think about. One other thing I might add just to build, uh, one of the points was made was about the use and concerns about substance use that are happening, increasing mm -hmm. during the pandemic. But on the treatment side, you knit, alluded to this, Nikki, and I thought we might just emphasize that aspect of it too that the pandemic has led a lot of providers who treat opioid use disorder to right. start thinking about different ways of how they manage it for those in methadone clinics. Do we really need to have patients come in every day? And when can we have patients right. go home? Do we need to do urine tox testing on a certain interval? And again, those kinds of way, uh, changes to the care patterns can potentially increase access to care for patients uh, because they'll be able to uh, get that care without all the inconvenience of going in every day. So I just wanted to highlight that because that was a negative that we raised, which is concerns about substance use, but I do think there is this potential uh, positive effect of potentially changing the way we provide care for substance use disorders and therefore uh, expanding access. And Yeah, and I think Going along with that too is the, if we're talking about um, making sure that more primary care physicians are able to, you know, uh, prescribe buprenorphine, people aren't going to a methadone clinic in order to deal with um, an opioid addiction or something, that would, that would make a big difference as well, because you take away some of the stigma um, that people might have. Good. Thanks. So the next... Um... The next question is, is one that, you know, I think I've heard a lot over the years and I'm, which is, is again for Craig, which is, can you comment on opportunities for state and local health departments to better collaborate with state and federal emergency management? But I might maybe put an additional twist on this question, which is sort of what do you, how do you think that we can leverage what's happened in this pandemic to actually improve the collaboration and coordination. Um, you know, what are the positive changes that have occurred and how can we um, accelerate those and make them last? Well, again, I think when you're talking about a pandemic, uh, at least when we were planning for it, we saw this as a team effort that uh, public health would be primarily focused on the epidemiological, the uh, protective measures in dealing with the disease directly. And emergency management would support that and plan for the consequences of the impacts of the disease. We did a lot of this with H1N1, looking at how uh, various industries would be impacted, uh, not so much by social distancing, but just the impact of people being sick and unable to work. So I think those lessons we somehow got away from and we need to reinforce that a pandemic is not just a public health emergency. It is a disaster. <clears throat> and we need all of the uh, various components working together, complementing each other, uh, allowing public health to be the lead on the disease and using an emergency management and those teams to support that process, but also be prepared to deal with the consequences and the fact that disasters don't stop for a, a, a disease outbreak or a virus and constantly updating that uh, planning process. It only works if the organizations trust each other, work as a team, 
and are less concerned about who's at the podium speaking next to the president and more about how do we ensure that we work as a team for the, uh, the well-being of our communities. Well said, and I can think of, of so much of the pandemic planning we did both during H1N1, incorporating lessons learned, doing it again during the Ebola um, situation, et cetera. And I think you're right, there are just so many opportunities uh, for teamwork to continue to improve planning, but also to use the plans um, uh, that we have. So next question, I think, um, goes to um, Professor Smetters and maybe to Atif, but also maybe to you, Linda. And, and the question really has to do with, are we seeing the same kinds of trends Mm. in other kinds of, some of the trends in, in mental health and, and violence. So let's start with Professor Smetters and sort of go down the line here. Um, I'm not sure if I'm the only one. I only heard part of the question, I think. Screen yeah. hit it. Uh oh, froze. sorry. Nikki, okay. You froze up there for a moment, Nikki. Okay, so froze. So the question really had to do with whether we're seeing the same kinds of things internationally that we're seeing here in the US, whether it's on impacts on the economy and economic recovery, which might be particularly interesting since other countries chose to handle their unemployment uh, situation differently than the US, whether we're seeing it similar, similar changes internationally in use of the delivery system and decreases, and then um, maybe from the mental health and domestic violence perspective as well. Right. So from an economic per perspective and transmission per perspective, there's a lot of heterogeneity um, throughout the world. I mean, uh, of course, it, coming back to the earlier point um, that was made, if countries are prepared for this, like in Taiwan, they're very prepared ahead of time for this, that is going to mean um, a, a much fewer cases, infections. In their case, they have had only eight deaths so far and also um, uh, much less uh, shutting down the economy. So we've seen lots of heterogeneity um, in terms of South Korea and Japan, how they locked down was very different than say the United States. There was actually not as much locking down, but at the same time, they had more testing and uh, as well as more contact tracing. I think contact tracing, despite all the buzz around it, honestly, is. Is, is not very effective when you don't have rapid tests. And um, at least that's what the, what the models and the data seems to, to be suggesting. Um, so, and then of course the opposite extreme of all this is Sweden where they didn't shut down very much. At the same time, um, you know, they've had in terms of cases per 100,000, actually despite ever, uh, a lot of the media comparing Sweden to Finland and, and Denmark, Sweden also has fewer cases than, say, other countries that have, shut, uh, that have locked down, including um, the United Kingdom and others. And so there's tremendous heterogeneity, but uh, I think one of the common factors that really does come down to personal social distancing. In Sweden, they could get away with it. Partly there's a very communal um, f factor there. Um, it's a much more hom homogenous population. Trust in government is very high. People actually like to pay their taxes. Uh, there and um, because of that trust and um, their people took on personal actions, did they see their economy slow down? They did, uh, simply because of personal social distancing meant that uh, despite what you saw on TV with people, restaurants being full, restaurants were actually less full than they uh, usually were. Um, and, and so a lot of the slowdown is actually not just legal, it's also personal uh, uh, social distancing. So I think, you know, for the United States, it's really hard to glean what is the right lessons because if we, for example, as we remove lockdowns and um, are, is this gonna be Hong Kong? Uh, is it where uh, people took that as a signal that things are okay and so they really reduce their personal social distancing or is it gonna be a little bit more like some Scandinavian countries where people still understand they have to be very careful here. Um, and I think that's gonna vary a lot across states in the United States. I don't think, think of the United States as a homogenous uh, 
you know, a population like other uh, countries. And so I think it's going to be a heterogeneous uh, uh, reaction to it. Um, and it's going to be really a state by state, even county by county uh, response. Thanks. Atif, have you been tracking at all healthcare utilization in other countries and have similar things been happening? Yeah, so there we don't, I haven't personally been tracking, so I can only tell you anecdotes, but certainly the drop in visits that we observed here in the United States was echoed in other countries, um, I, uh, as well as their tremendous investments in telemedicine. I do think that one of your questions was related specifically to mental illness, and there I do think that there is uh, a divide there that I'm concerned about. Building on the divide I talked about here in the United States and the digital divide, majority of the visits we see in our data in the behavioral health side are provided by telemedicine right now in the United States. That means that that's been the way that those visits have been provided. And that's why the number of visits has declined relatively less than in other clinical areas. That is not the same opportunity as, as it is in other nations. And so that's going to be a major issue uh, in that particular area in other countries where they may not have that ability to uh, quickly transition to the telehealth side. Thanks. Linda, do you want to comment on this? Sure. Um, I think, you know, I would agree with that. It's the issue of transitioning to the telemedicine. But I think the other thing we need to keep in mind is what goes on in the, what might go on in a developing country where there isn't so much access to care to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have, a, you know, there's, and, and then you have places where we have refugee camps, we have um, other group, you know, other uh, large sort of um, settlements of people who don't have access to healthcare or very much access at all on a regular basis. So um, I think we'll see a lot of differences there that we wouldn't see looking at Europe or, you know, mm -hmm. um, the UK, um, Hong Kong, those kinds of places. So I think we need to keep that in mind as well. Good, thanks. Um, let's do one more question, I think, and then um, I can try to share a couple of thoughts and, and sum up. So this one really is about, how much of the perceived avoidance in non-COVID care is due to fear and how much is due to closure of healthcare facilities, um, stopping elective surgeries, et cetera? And the next part of the question is, how can we persuade the public that it's not only safe but imperative that they seek care? Yeah, no, that's a... Uh... You know, one of the themes I think across all the presentations has been the challenges in communication that we have. And so I think that in many ways, we were very successful as the healthcare world saying, look, you know, stay home when you need to. But in doing so, there might have been an over uh, that message may not have had the nuance or clarity as necessary that. But if there is something significant and major that we, we want you to come in. And so I think that message and the rebound that I described to you sh is illustrative of the fact that we're doing a bit of a better job, that if you have a healthcare problem, it is safe to come into a clinic. There have been ne numerous precautions that have been made, both in hospitals as well as clinics, to decrease transmission. Um, I also think that's going to play a role with the telemedicine side because it's a, it's a nuanced story that, or a thing that we want to tell patients. We want to say, look, it's safe. You can come into our clinics and get care. But, you know, if you don't have to come in, the telemedicine is just a little bit more safe. And so I think that's another nuance that's going to be a very difficult thing for us to tell and really is, an, again, a challenge in communication that we're going to see uh, there from hurricanes and whether you need to evacuate to whether you, when opening up the economy is, uh, uh, what does that really translate into your personal behavior? So uh, a very public health message that is always there in terms of public health communication. Good. Thanks. Let me see if any of our panelists want to have a last word before I sum up. Okay, so, you know, I'll just maybe a, a couple of reflections as I have been listening to these terrific presentations and really interesting questions. And I just want to thank the folks online for really terrific and interesting questions that always makes things um, much more, much better. I just wish there were a way to make some of this a little bit more interactive. But as I was listening to this, I was thinking a lot about my experience over the last month um, serving on the steering committee 
for uh, the DC mayor in terms of thinking about reopening. And, you know, I know, um, Professor Smitters, we use your work and, and others in, in thinking about that, but it was a very interesting experience to think about how it is that you might balance projected health impacts, particularly increases in transmission, as imperfectly modeled as they might be from different phases or stages of reopening and different kinds of behavior, and how it is that you as a city or a state think about how to balance that with jobs and with tax revenue for the city, and then to do it all really through this lens of equity. And I think um, the presentations today sort of really sort of highlighted some of the nuances of some of the challenges that we all faced in making some of those recommendations. The other thing that we were also very challenged by was thinking through, well, how is it that we might make some of those, um, you know, some of these changes that might have been more positive permanent in the process? And some interesting conversations really came out of that. You know, one was to think about a really huge push to expand internet access to poor and low income areas and have either free Wi-Fi or subsidized Wi-Fi, recognizing um, from an equity perspective that it's a prerequisite to signing up for any kind of benefits. And we now have tons more people around the country who are uninsured recognizing as a chief you pointed out that as a prerequisite for being access able to access telemedicine and telehealth frankly recognizing that it's really essential for contact tracing um and recognizing that for as long as schools or might be closed or on modified schedules it's really essential to learning so that was you know an example of a really big kind of push um that came out of it. You know, a second um, example of a set of pushes that came out of it was really thinking about how to strengthen and, and amplify and potentially change the kinds of people who might be working in health departments or working with health departments, you know, thinking about contact tracing and thinking about how to mobilize community violence prevention specialists, uh, mm -hmm. HIV educators, um, others to think about um, them being trusted community leaders and really working together with or learning to do contact tracing in communities, for example, because they may be the ones that know the community best. Um, talking about violence prevention through social distancing ambassadors, for example, particularly in areas that are hot spots of transmission. And so there was actually a lot of opportunity, I thought, um, for innovation just coming out of the experience that, that very much, I think, um, reflected some of the conversations um, that we've had today. Um, I think another thing um, that has come out of this, I don't know if we can make it stick, but despite the political divides and how politicized this has been, you know, I think we've seen in many, many communities, people like we do in other disasters, being nice to each other, helping one another out, mm. special efforts to help seniors who are stuck at home, think about how it is that you're going to get your grocery shopping done and doing all those other sorts of things. I don't know if we can make them stick. Um, maybe we can. Similarly, in the healthcare system, the whole crisis in PPE has made us think about how it is that we use healthcare resources and how to take steps to avoid crisis standards of care. How is it that we reuse and substitute and recycle and think about how we use resources so we don't get into a crisis? And those are kinds of things that we could do every day to help our healthcare system uh, be more efficient. Another questioner, I think, commented on really the unprecedented level of scientific collaboration we've had in some areas, whether it's around diagnostics development or understanding the epidemiology or vaccines development and scientific collaboration really from around the world. Um, how do we bottle that and think about making it last? 
And, you know, finally, I think whenever we're faced with any kind of major crisis like this, we really think about, well, is the goal here to rebuild back to where we were? Or is the goal here to rebuild back something better? Um, and to think about areas in great need of redesign. I think we've touched on that a little bit today uh, in terms of thinking about aspects of the healthcare system. I think from Professor Smetter's talk and others, there's ways to think about maybe even it, how it is that we redesign some aspects of our social safety net to think about how to become more resilient to different kinds of disasters, whether it's how we think about how to subsidize unemployment or what it is that we're gonna to do to help people um, maintain health insurance or how we're gonna to continue to strengthen our public health infrastructure going forward. So those are all challenges I think for us ahead. And as we think about our summer of COVID, you know, I think uh, while you're social distancing at the beach or doing other things, I think those, you know, thinking about how to rebuild positively and how to make those positive aspects of things last um, are really just so important. Uh, let me close by reminding you that our next webinar is June 10th at five o'clock and it's called The Road to Immunity to COVID-19 and it's really about developing and distributing a vaccine and we'll see where we are by then in that adventure as well. So let me thank you all again for participating. Let me thank our panelists for terrific presentations and our staff with, for whom, without whom this would just be absolutely uh, impossible to do. For those of you who are interested, this webinar has been recorded and a recording and a transcript will be available as will the slide presentations. There's been a lot of interest, I think, in getting access to the model. And so I expect that there will be a lot of demand for that. So thanks again for joining. Uh, please stay safe, uh, stay healthy, and until next time, bye-bye.